Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. One of the problems with unwritten rules is that they're unwritten. We've come crashing into that reality of late on at least two fronts. Once again, it's not the first time, but uh, as what was left of this year's baseball season is drawing to a close and playoffs are going on, we're having yet another controversy over bean balls. This is what happens when a pitcher throws at a player on purpose with the intention of hitting him with the ball. Uh, And it happens typically not just because I'm mad, not just because you hit a home run, but typically it happens uh, when an unwritten rule is perceived to have been broken. One of those unwritten rules is that when you do hit a home run, You don't showboat on your way around the bases. You don't make a big uh, public display of it. You just sort of hang your head and and jog around the bases. But if you jump and stomp and laugh and point and all of that, then the pitcher feels showed up and feels he's got the right to plunk you or someone on your team, which then uh, brings in a host of other unwritten rules Who you plunk means that the other team might have to plunk you, and then there's benches cleared, and it just gets really messy. The same thing is true on the issue of uh, lame duck uh, judicial appointments. And uh, related to that, that I want to get to is uh, not an unwritten rule, but some written rules. Because what happened? When there's a, one of the reasons for unwritten rules, as dangerous as they may be, uh, is they serve a purpose of not allowing us to devolve down into constant lawyer ease. Uh, you can't necessarily measure whether someone over celebrated their home run, uh, which is a bad thing and a good thing. So in the same way, one of the reasons we're in this situation where we've got a huge uh, struggle, political struggle over the appointment of uh, a Supreme Court justice in the waning uh, months of the president's first term, we don't know whether he'll have a second term, and that's the argument from the left is let's wait until uh, a new president is sitting. Because remember when Barack Obama was a lame duck president and he tried to nominate someone for the Supreme Court, the Senate wouldn't even uh, hear it. Well, then the distinction is made, and it's an important one, but subtle. When Barack Obama tried to do so, the Senate was predominantly or, or, or had a majority of Republicans, while Obama was a Democrat. Now we have a situation where President Trump is a Republican and the majority in Senate is still Republicans. And so they're saying it's different. It's different. But none of this stuff is written down one way or the other, which means on the one hand, there is no rule being broken. On the other hand, uh, well, there was no rule being broken either when the Republicans wouldn't hear uh, the president's uh Uh, President Obama's nominee, but it looked like it was the same. So here's my takeaway from all of this. One of the great dangers of unwritten rules is that when you don't follow them, it creates a a kind of cascading uh, element of, what's the word for it? Well, retaliation. Uh, it's sort of like taking off the gloves. It's, it's a, 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 a position that says, you know, our traditions and our history of even when we disagree, abiding by the rules, written or not, 
uh, has allowed us to stay at peace with each other. But when you stop obeying unwritten rules, then we will no longer obey unwritten rules and things are going to get ugly and nasty. This is, uh, this is part and parcel of the whole, uh, filibuster arguments a few years back and also relating to uh, Supreme Court nominees. My point I want us to get to, though, is not about who's right or who's wrong. My point is that what is lost is the capacity to disagree peaceably. You know, I have been going through a conversation with a young man on Twitter, which is difficult, uh, on the issue of whether or not one can affirm a standard of morality absent the existence of God. And uh, this poor fellow is in the unenviable position of trying to uh, sneak past me uh, a standard that is both real and uh, not transcendent over us. And he keeps flopping from one side to the other. And I keep pointing it out and saying, well, see, here is where you lost me because you did this. And here's where you lost me because you did that. But in the back and forth, it has been really pleasantly, well, pleasant. And in fact, just a, a you know three or four back and forths in, I sent him a message and said, you know, I just wanted to, even though I disagree with you on this, even though uh, you know we're way far away ideologically, I just want to tell you uh, that you're really good at doing this peaceably and graciously, and I want you to know that I notice and that I appreciate it. And he came back with, hey, you know, I've, I've studied on this issue, that is the issue of communication, and I've reached the conclusion that this is far healthier, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm like, good, great, well, it's working, and it's showing. Uh, and, you know, for me, that's a big part of even why I'm engaging in this conversation. You know, when uh, both sides can stay peaceful and calm, then both sides can avoid, again, an unwritten rule, sort of unwritten rule, of not casting our pearls before swine. Jesus told us not to do that. Well, what does that mean? Well, that the rule is written because Jesus said so, but what constitutes being a swine is not so clear and easy. But when someone's being gracious and kind and, and answering, and not committing ad hominem fallacies and attacking. Uh, I'm saying that's, that's not a swine. This guy's wrong. But uh, again, as long as he can do this, I'm happy to keep trying with him. And I'm happy to keep trying calmly and peacefully myself. Now, here we are just days away, maybe a few weeks away, depending on when this airs, days away from the election. And we have going on out in public where everyone can see uh, public questioning of whether or not uh, the winner will, or excuse me, the loser of the election will concede loss and if it is President Trump, leave office. We have on the other side a very public uh, refusal by the Democratic candidate to answer a simple question about whether or not uh, he will seek to uh, change the Constitution so that there are more uh, seats on the Supreme Court that he might have opportunity to fill. That's not good. But what I want us to get, remembering that it's probably not either of those gentlemen are listening to this podcast, but you are. And what I want you to do is be careful to disagree with care, with, with a gentle spirit. I have said it a hundred times. I've battled it all over the internet, everywhere. I see it over and over again, overzealous young, immature Christians claiming that no Christian could vote for a Democrat. Now, when I'm fighting this, I'm affirming with great vigor. I never have voted for a Democrat. I never would vote for a Democrat. I think it's a terrible, terrible thing to vote for a Democrat. I'm willing to say it's a sin to vote for a Democrat. And if you're a Democrat and a Christian, then... 
well, hopefully we can have a peaceable conversation about this. Because my chief concern right now is the people to both of our right who are saying, no, if you vote Democrat, you're outside the kingdom of God. Again, simple conversation just a few days ago. Someone said that and they, they posted uh, uh, no Christian could ever vote for a Democrat. I tweeted back, no Christian should vote for a Democrat. Fixed it for you. And we had some back and forth, and he, he basically was saying, well, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, and I'm saying, well, that's good, but what you said does not agree with what I said. What you said is uh, tiptoeing close to heresy. The, I don't know, I don't want to call it the Judaizing heresy, the Republicanizing heresy. I think there's all sorts of things that people do that are wrong that Christians do all the time. You know, like, I don't know, sin. I do it every day. So do you. And I don't believe, by the way, that all sins are equal. So I'm not trying to smash down the seriousness of the sin. But I would say this, that Jesus died for very serious sins. I can put it this way. I know a guy. Listen to this. I know a guy who was a believer. Now, you can dispute that if you want, but I don't think you're going to want to. He was a believer, and he supported the ongoing, uh, what's the word for it? He supported politically a ruler who did all sorts of terrible things, including consulting a medium, talking to a witch. And this guy still supported him. And the guy who supported this guy that consulted the witch, he eventually took over in that position of authority. And while he was in that position of authority, he had an illicit relationship with someone who wasn't his wife. And then to cover it up, he committed murder. Now, this was no baby believer. From the time this believer was a youth, he exhibited enormous faith. In fact, he wrote songs that the church still sings to this day. His name is David. If King David or I can commit grievous sins after being a believer, adultery, Murder, drunk driving, then yeah, a Christian can vote for a Democrat. It is a terrible thing. So is murder. So is drunk driving. So is adultery. Do not, in your zeal and your passion, lose sight of the fact that we are all sinners saved by grace. Don't build such walls that are so high the gospel itself can't get over them or you'll find yourself on the wrong side. Don't lose the opportunity and the capacity to speak to your brothers and sisters in Christ about their sin by practicing unilateral personal excommunication. It's not right. It's not a sign of zeal for the kingdom. It's a sign of foolishness. 
So let's pray that we all follow all the rules, written and unwritten, all the righteous rules, all the rules that should be there. And let's also pray that we judge one another with charity. I've mentioned before, I believe, that it's my habit from time to time to take up and read the book of 1 Corinthians as a means of comforting my spirit. That when I look at the condition of the church, my own personal condition, it's very easy to get discouraged, frustrated, and think, how in the world could anything good ever come out of any of this? When I read the book of 1 Corinthians, it's not because uh, it's a wonderful story of people who've turned their lives around, uh, but because it's a story of terrible people who've been declared righteous, who are called saints. We see the mess that is the church at Corinth, and we think, okay, it's bad, but it's not weird bad. Well, in this Bible in Five Minutes segment, I'm not going to talk about 1 Corinthians, but rather I will talk about 1 Kings, because the book of 1 Kings does something similar to that. When we look at uh, the life and the work of David, which uh, we're given the most information on that in 1 and 2 Samuel, uh, with a, a quick, broad overview, we think mostly positively, but when we watch uh, it played out in space and time, reading through those accounts. Uh, it's a lot darker than sort of what we remember from Sunday school. And as we uh, turn the page now and come to Solomon, we, we see a positive turn. As David, weary, tired, things not exactly where he wanted them to be, but he's prepared as much as he can. He's trained up his son. And Solomon is made king, and you're back at that place of blessing. And Solomon's given the blessing to, to go ahead and build the temple. Uh, the, the account of that is given, and, and, and we really, in some very real sense, the pinnacle of the uh, era of the kings is more Solomon than it is David. Uh, there's more peace, more prosperity, more uh, uh, prestige and power and authority uh, around the world during the ministry of Solomon. And Solomon had that great uh, request of God for wisdom, and he's got all of this wealth, and he gives us the so many of the Proverbs, and and then he blows it. He's taken on all of these new wives. And the same fellow who built the temple to the living God with God's blessing, which temple God descended into in the Shekinah cloud, the same fellow who lived through that built temples to foreign gods in the land to appease his foreign wives. Well, the rest of the book of 1 Kings takes us from uh, David's death and Solomon's ascension all the way through uh, the ministry of Elijah. And it is uh, mostly down for Israel, uh, a few high marks. But for Judah, it's a little bit more of a 50-50 proposition. Uh, but you just go, even that is just so depressing. Along comes this good king, it might be Hezekiah, it might be Uzziah, and that king will have a failure. Or along comes a good king, and that king will have a bad son for a king. All sorts of hardships and disappointments going on throughout the book of First Kings. It's frustrating. But just as with the saints in First Corinthians, one of the messages that we get from first Kings is that God does not leave his people. He doesn't depart from them. In fact, one of the ways that we know things are going badly is that God over and again sends prophets, including the prophet Elijah. And when he does so, because the prophet comes and says, whoa, because the prophet comes and says, you need to repent, uh, we tend to think, oh, this is a bad thing. This is this is God now getting angry and 
uh, you know, bad times are here again, when the reality is even the sending of the prophet is an act of God's grace. The sending of the prophet is not, in a manner of speaking, significantly different from what Jesus does when he leaves the 99 to go in search of the one. Sending the prophet is calling God's people to come back, to plead with them. All you got to do is repent. All you got to do is acknowledge the living God. He's been so good to you. Come back. He will forgive you. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Don't forget that. A, as you're reading through the book of 1 Kings, don't forget that this is a story of God's grace in the midst of God's people struggling with sin. And then the same should be true in your life. Don't lose sight of the fact that even the hardships that God sends into your life that grow out of the consequences of your sins are gifts from God to call you to repentance. If you are his, if you belong to him, your righteousness does not depend upon what you do. The righteousness you have is the righteousness of Christ. The love that he has for you does not depend upon you. The love he has for you is the love he has for Christ. But every bit of hardship is a call, a loving father disciplining us that we would grow in grace and obedience. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't let the serpent come along behind you and say, oh, look at the mess you've made. God must really hate you. Look at the hardship you're in because of your sin. God sent this to you in his anger because he should be angry at you because you're so awful. No. Even the hardship is God's gentle hand calling us back. Do not lose heart. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.